Hello students, welcome back to the course on organizational behavior, individual dynamics in organization. So if you have uh, seen the previous lectures, you must have noticed that we are traveling through diversity. We have looked into diversity with uh, great detail. We have understood what diversity is and how diversity essentially will not reciprocate to inclusion in an organization. We have also seen how things like ableism has come up, which creates a sort of discrimination and which goes against the spirit of diversity. Now today, being the last lecture of this module, diversity management, we'll look into the details of what diversity in itself means. We'll look into what specifically stereotyping, prejudice, and how discrimination emanates within the organization. I'm Dr. Abraham Sirla Isaac, Assistant Professor, School of Business, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. Welcome again to this module. So let's look into diversity's downsides and benefits. Let's look into the first and the foremost thing, which is stereotyping. Now, this is very critical. Many a time we hear uh, the words like stereotype being misused at different places. We have to technically understand what stereotyping is. And I would try to make it clear with an example. Let us understand a, a, a situation where a manager says that old people are not healthy enough to contribute well. In other words, old people are not healthy enough to work well. This is the classic case of stereotyping. Now, if we look into this stereotyping and we take this one step ahead, let's look into situations where the same old people are denied a job because of some preconceived notions that if they come into the workforce, they are not going to be productive enough. If that is the thing which is hampering, which is creating a sort of uh, hindrance to the workforce, to the entry of uh, these people into the workforce, that is specifically prejudice. And once the manager takes a step more to create barriers, to create steps, to create situations or context where the people cannot come into organization, and if at all they come into the organization, they create some level of barrier so that they are shunted out, this leads to discrimination. So I hope Stereotyping, prejudice and discrimination is clear. Now, yet another downside of this diversity would be tokenism. Many a time we see in organizations, minority groups, women, or, or uh, you know, the minority representations are given key positions only for the sake of publicity, only for the sake of optics, only for the sake of visibility. So this shows that the company, inadvertently shows that the company is actually promoting when the actual intention is not of diversity management, rather it is just a management of the minimal structure or the least amount of people who can actually represent as part of the diversity. So tokenism exists in most of the organizations. If you, if you see it critically, many a time you will see that many organizations come up with a strategy of tokenism to show off to showcase that these organizations are very prone, very punctual in terms of what is known as diversity, but actually that rests only in paper. Yet another aspect is ethnocentrism, where a certain set of, I've already discussed this in the previous lectures, where we discussed or understood the difference between a group in homogeneity and heterogeneity. So when a certain sect of people or certain group of people feel comfortable only with the similar traits or similar uh, background people, then it, it leads to ethnocentrism. So the development or the career progressions of those individuals are strictly aligned with the support, the social support garnered or obtained by that individual within that support structure, which is very conducive for him or her. In other words, there are people who actually feel left out disconnected, isolated within an organization. They are aloof in an organization for the simple reason that they do not get the required support because they are not treated as someone who is similar to their group, similar to their uh, sect, similar to their uh, religion, race, sex, caste, whatever it is. So this is tokenism. And finally, glass ceiling is something which we all know. There is certain hindrance, there is certain barrier for the diverse group, for the diversity people who are, who are in the background of diversity to actually raise above the organization. And every now and then they 
come to some key positions, they feel that they are left out or they are omitted carefully or intentionally so that they don't get the required position which they are otherwise qualified for, which they otherwise desire for. Now let's look into the positive side of diversity. There is no doubt that diversity enhances the climate of inclusion. It brings in not only different types of people from different culture, caste, creed, sex, race, ethnicity, etc. Not only in paper, but it also brings in inclusion. Not only in terms of diversity in demographics, but also in terms of cognitive diversity. So you get to feel that every heterogeneous group will you contribute more to the organizational uh, goals, organizational objectives. And you get to reflect on these perspectives, reflect on these ideas that come otherwise, will not come otherwise from the different groups which are otherwise homogeneous. So the first and the foremost important aspect or the positive thing is the inclusion that the diversity climate provides. Now there is there are studies which have categorically pointed out that less diversity actually leads to less productivity. It's a uh, extension of the previous point where you see that the moment you are in a homogeneous group, there is a possibility of things like group think that can come in. So in such situations where the issues like group think can uh, squeeze in, then in those situations you don't tend to take effective decisions. What all you discussed on base, basis of evidence-based management, on basis of scientific management or on basis of uh, systematic approach towards a particular problem, you are not able to undertake or take up to the solution part mainly because you don't have the heterogeneity. There is some few segment of people, a group of people, a set of people who are guiding the decision which is making the decision making all the more less productive. So less diversity leads to less productivity. Now it is also understood from different studies that diversity leads to employee commitment. The moment you see that you are from a diverse background and the organization does not take that into heed, it takes, it gives you every single opportunity from right from the recruitment to the promotion to the performance everywhere you get the right opportunity equal opportunity across the organization then you feel more welcome you feel that there is that sense of ownership that you are getting there is that sense of belongingness that you are being treated as one among them you are being treated uh, there is no level of indifference that is happening to you then it categorically raises your employee commitment. So these are some of the downsides and benefits of diversity which I thought would be beneficial for you if you venture into an organization and you would have understood this in greater detail. Now let's look into the crux of today's session managing diversity. Now when I'm talking about managing diversity is nothing but maximizing diversity's advantage while minimizing the barriers. These are the two aspects. One would be I will be more keen on increasing what all advantages I can get because of diversity and second I will categorically try to minimize the barriers that are otherwise leading to diversity. So when you look into different aspects of managing diversity there are two critical aspects. One is you are working on a compulsory platform, compulsory actions, basis of compliance, policy compliance or guidelines where it is thoroughly established rule that you have to have this much of representation of people. So the first thing is when you are you are bound to do compulsory action. That's the first and the foremost thing. But having said that, you have to also understand that there are certain requirements of voluntary actions. Encouraging employees to work together. This does not come as part of any compliance. This does not come out as a result of any uh, hard and fast rule that you have established or some policy guidelines that have been coming from the government's part, from the authorities' part. No. There should be some voluntary initiative. There should be some voluntary initiative where you tend to see that your workforce essentially has different set of people and all those people are coming into the organization. They are welcome and they get what they desire, what they are qualified for and what they actually perform for. So this is what is to be understood when you are looking into managing diversity specifically. There are compulsory actions and there are voluntary actions. That said, you have two wings. One is to look into the top-down programs, how you can manage diversity. When you are looking into diversity, the first and the foremost thing in top-down program would be to provide strong leadership. 
when i'm looking into strong leadership i have to appreciate that how the leadership envisages how the leadership actually plans for diversity that is how it percolates that is how it actually trickles down to the bottom so when you when you take policy decisions at the top that this for the next uh, full year let's say from 2023 to 2024 and 2025 for the next two years your workforce percentage increase in the diversity should be let's say 20 percent then that commitment should be essentially reflected at the top which would be trickled down to the bottom and that's how the organization actually comes in the path of diversity and further inclusion so positive strong leadership is vital you have to assess the situation when you are looking into top-down programs you have to assess where does the organization stand today where does the organization stand in terms of workforce deviation in terms of how uh, how much representation has to be there but it is not there so something like you look into the the equal opportunity metrics or you look into the retention metrics all these aspects would show you that what has the organization done let's say in the previous quarter in the previous year or let's say in the last two financial years and how it has performed over and over in the last two years this would ensure that you get a clear hold of the situation under consideration. Now let's look into another top-down ap approach which is provide diversity training and education. You feel that your workforce is having a clear representation but that means that there is lack of cohesion. There is that people are not able to uh, understand each other. They are not able to comprehend, ac accept, appreciate the different, let's say, cultural ramifications or the differences in terms of language, in terms of the dress, in terms of their food. So all these things have to be mitigated and this can happen with proper diversity training, which is yet again another top-down approach. Another aspect could be to change the culture and management system let's say you are you are a company which is which is established in the northern part of the the hemisphere now you are not very much aware about what is the southern culture what is the different east asian culture you have to work with people who are from different cultural contexts in that context you have to understand that you need to merge into you need to emerge with a with a common culture with the organizational culture that is encompassing every single culture that is absorbing all the positives of all the different culture and is trying to welcome all the people from all the different culture and finally evaluate the diversity management program now it's this is easily said than done to to conduct diversity management programs but how effective are they how effective are the diversity management programs once you conduct them and once you get some results on them so you have to understand what happened after post uh, diversity management program how has your retention metrics improved whether there is any more attrition rate that is consistently increasing what about the different attitudinal trainings that have happened has it brought in certain measurable changes so these are some things which lead me to agm diversity training program agm means approach goals executive commitment and mandatory attendance when you are looking into approach what is the approach the organization is taking in is it making a welcome approach is it more antagonistic to the people who are coming let's say the higher management had a better intention of accepting and inviting people from different culture to their workforce but the workforce which is existing now the present workforce is not so welcoming there is a lot of tussle between them they are not ready to delegate the work they are not ready to delegate the responsibilities and the authority then it has to change the approach the second one would be goals you have to look into smart goals goals which are measurable not that diversity was let's say your target was to have a certain level of diversity and as part of tokenism you had given some key positions to some minority groups or some specific gender that does not mean that you are an organization that is compliant with the norms of diversity that you are an organization that is more inclusive you have to understand and keep measurable goals year on year what is your performance in terms of diversity and inclusion how has the company benefited from the diversity policy that it has followed if not then how can it rectify and bring in a 
better diversity profile or di diversity policy altogether. The third aspect would be executive commitment. You need people at the helm. You need people at the head. The optics is relevant where you create a visibility that yes, this is the person, this is the, the CEO who is going for diversity, who is the, the evangelist of diversity and has been doing it and you know making diversity the key objective for the organization and the organization has been reaping its benefits because of that. So this executive commitment is also vital. And finally, when you're looking into diversity training process, the mandatory attendance is critical. It's not that you are doing the diversity training process just for formality, just for a namesake. Rather, you are more committed to, as I've already mentioned, there is a top line, there is a top management which is committed to the work of diversity training process. And all these aspects have to be reciprocated by the entire employees within the organization. And there, the relevance of the mandatory attendance is critical. So this is what the whole aspect of framework of managing diversity is all about. When I'm talking about managing diversity, I'm essentially looking into maximizing diversity's advantages and minimizing the barriers that can be coming in way of diversity. Now let's look into how to encourage inclusiveness. In the previous lecture, I've already introduced the concept that managing or diversity essentially need not lead to inclusiveness. Let's look into how you encourage or how you can encourage inclusiveness. There are certain inclusive strategies and there are certain barriers to inclusion. I'll take them side by side from different point of view. The first one is personal level. Let's look into the personal level. When you're looking into inclusive strategies, you have to be aware about the prejudice and other barriers that are there in valuing diversity. If there are some preconceived notions that let's as an example i've taken already that you are not appreciative towards the old age workforce. You don't appreciate Anybody who has completed, let's say, 20 years of uh, their service in valuable service in the organization, the vast experience they have, you think that they are redundant, they don't know the technology, the recent technology, then this is the first barrier at the personal level. Learn about other cultures and groups. This is something that has come up, should come up as an inclusive strategy. You should be given proper training. The employee should be aware about the different culture, different aspects. In, within and outside the group. Serve as an example, walk the talk. Be the individual who not only talks, but also walks the talk. Be the individual who is totally going for diversity and also looks in for a heterogeneous group, who actually takes in the opinion. Be the team leader who gives an environment of psychological safety within the team or within the group. Let everybody be it, be the person from different background, it does not matter. Let him or her have the voice. Don't try to curtail the voice, the employee voice. So this is what another, yet another important inclusive strategy is. And the fourth one at the personal level would be participate in managing diversity. All the programs which we were mentioning otherwise have to be understood in this background. The, at the personal level, every individual employee need to participate in managing diversity. And this is vital. When you are looking into an organization's commitment, there is a certain limitation that the top management can actually establish. If the, the workforce is not ready to accept it, not ready to take the spirit of the organization at the top level in managing diversity forward, then it actually becomes detrimental to the organization. Now let's look into the barriers at the personal level. As I already mentioned, stereotypes and prejudices. When you have preconceived notions, when you have already established that this sect of people, this group of people are not good, they are not going to perform, they are not going to add to the efficiency of the organization, then this inevitably happens to be a barrier to inclusion. Let's look into another barrier which is past experiences and influences. You might have not very good experiences with a certain segment of people previously, but that might be a, a different category altogether, different context altogether. You are in, living in a different era. You are living in a different place. You are living in a different organization. Altogether, you are a totally different changed personality. You are thinking it from different perspectives. So that should ensure that 
your past experiences which might be negative no doubt about it and the influencers should not hamper the diversity objectives of the organization yet another aspect would be stereotyped expectations and perceptions because of the experience that has come up over your time period over your uh, let's say in your lifetime the influences which you had that should not lead you to stereotype type expectations feelings that tend to separate and divide there are certain individuals who take the leadership strategy as divide and conquer divide and rule be the person who takes the whole group together be the manager who takes the whole group together not the person who tries to divide and conquer divide and get the things done for the organization let's look into the interpersonal level when you're looking into the interpersonal level specifically in terms of encouraging inclusiveness the first and the foremost thing is to facilitate communication and interactions interpersonal relationship happens to be the most vital part if you are an organization and at the interpersonal level the communication is weak the employees do not interact the the, the groups are at a peril because there is a certain level of communication that always happen and if that is not happening the task are not being achieved or done within the specified deadline and it accumulates and it compounds to make the whole thing a redundant process so the first and the foremost thing would be to facilitate communication another inclusive strategy would be to encourage participation facilitate unique contribution you might think that people from different background they are silent because they are not aware of they are not knowledgeable enough or they don't have an answer to the question you are seeking sometimes it is because of the group thing sometimes it is because of uh, the lack of uh, the experience or it might be clearly because of the personality trait they might not be open to the, those changes or they they might not be open or extrovert in in bringing out in eliciting their opinion so this is where you have to facilitate the unique contribution you have to understand that every single individual from each context has certain things to say has certain things to contribute there is a solution that he or she can bring from their perspective be listen to that and be uh, facilitate such unique contributions let's look into another aspect which is resolve conflicts in way that value diversity you should not tend to the resolution methodologies which actually goes in counter purpose with the diversity you should not be a person who is actually gaining for the organization at the cost of individual employees let's be mindful about the people from different cultural backgrounds different diverse backgrounds let's be mindful that they are also your coworkers let's be mindful that we, they are also the people whom you share your office spaces with so this is what is critical when you are trying to resolve conflicts you have to resolve conflict in a way that value diversity and always accept responsibility for developing a common ground you think that there cannot be a common ground but take the initiative be the leader take the lead in actually establishing a ground which is common to everyone which can cater the needs of you as well as the people whom you think are diversely opposite to you in terms of cognitive diversity or even in terms of demographic diversity when you're looking into interpersonal level barriers obviously the first and the foremost one which we have detailed cultural differences there are people who are coming from different culture they might not uh, see or they might not appreciate or accept it might be a news to them in the initial part but slowly it should evade or it should diminish as a barrier there should there could be group differences there could be myths that are propagated against a particular segment of people in terms of the cultural dispositions or in terms of the attire the food pattern etc so there might be myth that, that 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 is surrounding them so they might not be aware about what are the myths or what are the differences group differences or preconceived notions that people are having against us so please do not take it as a barrier please do not uh, consider the myths and group differences rather go in for facilitating unique contributions as we have seen in terms of inclusive strategy look into relationship patterns based on inclusion and not exclusion you have to nurture a relationship whereby every single individual as i already mentioned has the psychological safety be the leader who actually encourages the psychological safety within the workplace let everybody raise their opinion let everybody have the chance 
to raise their opinion. That would be very vital in establishing a healthy relationship at the interpersonal level. The third most important thing would be at the organizational level and the inclusive strategies would be all employees have access to networks and focus groups. Now, this is something which is very vital. The moment you are into an organization and you feel that there are certain avenues and opportunities which you are shut off, we have discussed this extensively in lecture one and two of module two. So, if you are an, uh, an employee who, are, who is coming in as, let us say, as a graduate engineering trainee, and you are not given the equal chance or equal opportunity as others in terms of developing your career, in terms of career progression, you always feel that that ends up as a barrier to inclusion. All employees take a proactive role in managing diversity and creating a more diverse workplace culture need not put into it as a responsibility of the higher management. There is, at times there is a idea or there is a certain preconceived notion, okay, diversity is a, is a top level thing and the top management has to take care of it. No, the top management can certainly look into the compliance aspect as we have already seen. But when it comes to the voluntary actions, the compliance can bring in certain organizational policies, but are you in line, your behavior in line with the policies that are being drafted with respect to diversity? Are you certainly or are you clearly including the people who are from different groups, who are from different cultural contexts? This is what makes it all the more relevant when it comes to proactive role of a particular person. All employees give feedback to the teams and management. It is vital and all employees are encouraged to contribute to change. This is where what I mentioned as a psychological safety comes into picture. You are getting this opportunity to deliver your thought deliver your idea to communicate your, your solution to a particular problem that is not ridiculed upon, that is not laughed upon. Even if it's silly, maybe you, you bring in a different perspective altogether. You have a different uh, solution to the problem which nobody would have thought. So this is something that should be encouraged within a, a heterogeneous group. Otherwise, there is no need for diversity. There is no need for any inclusion. When we look at the organization level barriers, checking on individuals who, who get away with discrimination and exclusion. Now, there are certain individuals, whatever be the organizational policies existing, it will be in favor of the inclusion, it will be in favor of the diversity, but there are certain individuals at the core, at the heart, they are always against diversity, they are always against this inclusion. So, so try to identify these people, bring them to the limelight and try to give them proper training. Intervention is necessary. It's not that you have to ridicule them because we'll also discuss about uh, things like reverse discrimination etc. So when you are looking into such individuals try to educate them, try to bring them to limelight and see them and train them. Uh, there is certain intervention that is required in, in their behavioral pattern. A culture that values or allows exclusion is vital and that in inclusion is vital and exclusion should not be taken into consideration. So this if it is exclusion, a culture that values exclusion, then it essentially lands up as a barrier. You have to look into work structures, whether work structures, policies and practices are discriminatory in nature and are facilitating exclusion, then that also emerges that also emerges as a barrier to inclusion. So when we look into encouraging inclusiveness, these are certain inclusive strategies. These are certain barriers of inclusion. We have looked into a one personal level, second interpersonal level and third at the organization level. Now let's look into how we can develop a multicultural consciousness. Let's take the first step, which is take an active role in educating yourself. When you talk about multicultural aspect, you have to understand that there is a certain element. Let us be very subtle in, in, in understanding the different cultural phenomena. There might be an organization, you are part of a group. The end, let's say you have a group meeting. The moment you enter, there might be face you might not like. There might be a structure you might not like. There might be a smell you do not, do not like. There might be a food uh, that you might not like. Or there might be uh, the way of greeting that you might not like. Let us be very critical in understanding that you have to educate yourself. When you are talking about diversity, it looks all rosy. It looks all uh, glittering. 
but all that glitters is not gold. The moment you, you try to understand this, try to educate yourself, when you are going to work with a group, when you are going to work with a, a group which is having diverse background people, you are prone to see all these things which I've already mentioned. You might not feel everything at home. You might not feel that everything is quite known to you. You might have to work in situation which is quite strange, quite alien to you. This is where you have to take an active role in educating yourself. Put yourself in a learning mode in any multicultural setting. Try to absorb the good things from their culture, who is your co-worker or your co-employee. Look into the employee pattern, the behavior. Obviously, every single culture has a lot of positive things. Try to imbibe that, try to absorb that, put yourself in a learning mode in all this multicultural setting. Move beyond your personal comfort zone. You might be a person who would like to, let's say, interact only in your native language. You might be a person who will be only interested in interacting in your mother tongue. Move out of your comfort zone. You might be a person who will be only interested in eating a particular type of food but you are in a different workplace altogether where the food that is served is totally different. You might be ready, not ready to, you know, don an attire or put, a, put, a, put an attire which is not comfortable, but move out of your comfort zone. The organization demands it. The individual inclusiveness demands it. Don't be too hard on yourself if misunderstandings arise. Now, there are situations. Let us be all very honest with ourselves. To err is human. So we, we, we would have seen situations, we would have seen uh, aspects or context where, where we, we, we misunderstood the whole person altogether. We misunderstood what he or she wanted to communicate. We misunderstood what he or she actually meant. Or we didn't take that opportunity. We didn't facilitate him or her to tell the opinion or do the way he wanted or she wanted, which would have actually made it a big success in retrospect. Let's understand, we did a blunder, we did a mistake. Don't be too hard on yourself if misunderstandings arise. And finally, realize that you are not alone. Realize that you are not alone. You are part of a system which is trying hard to bring in multicultural perspective, to bring in multicultural consciousness as part of diversity. There are a lot of other people who are struggling like you. There are a lot of other people who think, who you think that are from a different culture, they also are in the same page, but in a different context. So they are also trying to develop a multicultural consciousness and the very realization that you are not alone is the key to guide you forward. Now let's look into affirmative action program. What do you mean by affirmative action? Affirmative action means making an extra effort to hire and promote those in protected groups, particularly when these groups are underrepresented. So there is some historical uh, perspective into it. There are certain groups which were underrepresented for certain time. So that underrepresentation has to be overturned. That has to be outweighed. For that, you bring in programs like affirmative action. So affirmative action is giving them a special opportunity, an extra effort to hire people to promote people, those who belong to those protected groups, so that at one point everybody comes into a level playing field. It's an it's a attempt to create such a level pay, playing field because they had some inherent disadvantages in the previous years. They faced, maybe the previous generation faced, they could not come into or they uh, come into limelight or they could not deliver or they are not in the same footing as everybody else, you give them a better opportunity. You give them a favorable environment so that they get what they actually are desiring or what they are qualified for. Now, implementing aff affirmative action programs, the first aim would be to use numerical analysis to determine which target groups the firm is underutilizing relative to the relevant labor market. For example, there might be a segment of people whom the organization is not uh, recognizing or has least manpower associated with that. Then this is the first aim to bring everybody to the same page. Second is to eliminate the barriers to equal employment. Every single organization worth its salt, you'll see that if, if you scroll through the advertisement that comes in print media or otherwise, you'll see that 
lot of organizations come up with this equal employment opportunity. So equal employment opportunity in itself gives you a certain understanding that okay this organization is good in terms of diversity. They are there to promote diversity. They are there to accept the different opinions that come in in the board. They are there to accept that there could be different people from different culture. This gives a positive connotation. This gives a positive reputation to the whole organization. Now the steps are simple recruiting minority online there there are things in in the west like let's say hispanics online or uh, you know caste based web structures caste based online portals which actually bring in a lot of workforce into these affirmative action programs you have to also guide the existing employee or existing workforce that there should not be any employee resistance because you are part of the whole system and the the organization needs to build, needs to create a diversity of its own, needs to improve on the diversity figures. So employment resistance will be counter purpose to their, their commitment to their effort. And finally, you have to understand the program evaluation, whether it is actually delivering what is it actually meant for. Sometimes affirmative action programs just end up in paper. They don't translate in, into the work. Or sometimes it happens that affirmative action programs goes too far so that reverse discrimination happens, which also we'll discuss in the next slide. So let's look into implementing affirmative action programs. The first would be to look into recruiting minorities online. Another aspect would be to curtail or to control the employee resistance. Another would be to look into the program evaluation. Now, what is reverse discrimination? As I already mentioned, the reverse discriminations are situations in which individuals from historically privileged or majority groups gets victimized. They claim to be victims of discrimination based on their different race, ethnicity, gender or other protected characteristics. So it's basically opposite of discrimination which is reverse discrimination. You were part of a majority group. You were initially part of a historically privileged group. But because of affirmative action programs, because of the quest to improve the minority or the diversity aspect, to bring in more diversity into play, you are getting eliminated or you are getting disadvantages. The, all the policies are becoming a disadvantage to you. It is hindering your progress within the organization. So they start claiming claiming they start claiming to be victims of this discrimination based on whatever characteristics they are represented for. So initially they were in the majority group, but now they are victimized. They are claiming to be the victims of discrimination. This is reverse discrimination. So in essence, it is the assertion that affirmative action or other groups or other efforts to address historical discrimination against marginalized groups that has resulted in unfair treatment or disadvantages for individuals from non-marginalized or majority groups. Let's look into this in, in, in a greater detail in 30 seconds. There, were, there was a marginalized group and you are trying to cater to the needs of marginalized group. But the non, initially the non-marginalized group or let's call them the privileged group, they had a clear representation. But as this affirmative action programs went above, as the affirmative action programs went uh, in an in a, in a uncontrolled manner, the people who were otherwise privileged, the people who were otherwise not discriminated against are getting victimized. And this is known as reverse discrimination. So let's look into managing diversity for success. Let's conclude this session with a case of IBM. IBM has always been a leader in diversity management. Yet the way diversity was managed was primarily to ignore differences and provide equal employment opportunities. Thus, this changed when Louis Gressner became CEO in 93. Gressner was surprised at the low level of diversity in senior ranks of the company. For all the effort being made to promote diversity, the company still had what he perceived a masculine culture. In 95, he created eight diversity task forces around demographic groups such as women and men, as well as Asians, African Americans, LGBT, individuals, Hispanics, Native Americans, and employees with disabilities. These task forces consisted of senior level, well-respected executives and higher level managers and members were charged with gaining an understanding of how to make each constituency feel more welcome and at home at IBM. Each task force conducted a series of meetings and 
surveyed thousands of employees to arrive at key factors concerning each particular group. For example, the presence of a male-dominated culture, lack of networking opportunity, and work-life management challenges. Top the list of concerns for women. Asian employees were most concerned about stereotyping, lack of networking, and limited employment development plans. African Americans employee concerns included retention, lack of networking, and limited training opportunities. Armed with a list of priorities, the company launched a number of key programs and initiatives to address these issues. As an example, employees looking for a mentor could use the company's website to locate one willing to provide guidance and advice. What is probably most unique about this approach is that the company acted on each concern, whether it was based on reality or perception. They realized that some women were concerned that they would have to give up leading a balanced life if they wanted to be promoted to higher management, whereas 70% of the women in higher levels actually had children, indicating that the perceptual barriers can also act as a barrier to employee aspirations. IBM management chose to deal with this particular issue by communicating better with the employees, as well as through enhancing their network program. So what was the result of these programs? If you look into detail, IBM tracks results through global surveys around the world and identifies which programs have been successful and which issues no longer are viewed as problems. So these programs were instrumental in more than tripling the number of female executives worldwide as well as doubling the number of minority executives. The number of LGBT executives increased sevenfold and executives with disabilities triple. With growing emerging markets and women and minorities representing 1.3 trillion USD market, IBM's culture of respecting and appreciating diversity is likely to be a source of competitive advantage. So you see that there are different surveys that were conducted, different reasons were found out, but there was certain mentorship program that was enacted or that, that was brought in, which emerged as a big success. So that was the result of the program. So when you look into historic perspective, when you look into discrimination, every time, every single time, Diversity does not translate to inclusion. So the entire module, the crux of the module, if you ask me, the diversity part does not translate in itself to inclusion. This learning is what I would like you to take with this particular module. If you want to have diversity, you, you, you may have obtained diversity, but you might not have got the required inclusion. You might not have got the required inclusion because there could be issues like ableism, which we have discussed in the previous lecture. There could be issues of discrimination. You have seen that stereotyping would lead to preconceived notions or prejudices, which will ultimately lead to discrimination. So please do not encourage your organization to lead itself in the way of stereotyping, in the way of uh, prejudices, in the way of discrimination. Because diversity essentially is not only demographic, it could be cognitive. And it could be really helpful if you try to bring in a lot of different perspective. You try to work in a heterogeneous group. You try to bring in a lot of different ideas. Being a manager, you can enhance the psychological safety within the organization. Let everybody have their chance to talk. Let everybody have their chance to reciprocate. Let everybody have their chance to build and work for the organization. Then only you will get the sense of ownership. Then only you will get the sense of belongingness. So with that, I end today's lecture. See you all in the next class. Thank you for being with me. Bye-bye.